I start this video essay by thanking the universe for the opportunity of being alive. I thank all of this nature and the ores and metals of the cameras that record me now so that I can make some use of the use we made of them here. I also thank my students and supporters of this channel and project on the crowdfunding websites like Patreon. Without you, this work would not be possible. Have you read about indigenous philosophies or Native American philosophies? What do you know about them? Today, we're going to talk about indigenous philosophies and how they are ways of life. I speak as someone who lived among a people, the Shavanti people of Brazil, for some time and who had many other experiences with indigenous peoples. I'm not an indigenous person, so my speech here is of someone who is interested in the thoughts and ways of life of others and who places himself as an ally of these others. My name is Rodrigo Guim, an anthropologist and social critic, and this is Critique with Nietzsche and Foucault. Today I will talk about indigenous philosophies or Native American philosophies. I will speak only as someone who has read what indigenous philosophers are saying or what those who don't claim to be philosophers but who write about this topic are saying. And here I made a point of just talking about what I saw being repeated by several scholars giving priority to indigenous writers teachers that I was able to access. I certainly found many more interesting subjects and ways of thinking, but I didn't bring them here because they were readings brought by some specific indigenous thinkers only. I brought here what I found in terms of similar subjects between many of them, but I also cannot say that these thoughts that I will present are universal subjects or approaches for all indigenous thinkers. I'll show you a collection of statements about indigenous philosophies that I was able to collect mainly among indigenous people of Brazil and of the United States. In both countries we have indigenous thinkers and writers. The production of indigenous philosophy in writings is quite recent either because we are talking about oral traditions or because the colonial process made it difficult for these peoples to dis disseminate writing. In Brazil, we have many indigenous writers, but few producing writings that claim to be philosophical. So I went to look for in readings also in the United States, where we already have a number of indigenous peoples writing about philosophy. However, even if we may find many convergences or consensus among indigenous thinkers in Brazil and in the United States, I speak here of indigenous philosophies or Native American philosophies as is used in the United States. I speak of them in the plural, precisely to recognize that no matter how there are many convergencies, uh, each people have their own philosophies and each individual is also a part of this creation of the philosophies that are above all ways of existing and of having an experience in the world. Indigenous philosophies don't exist without the indigenous way of life. Unfortunately, in many places, capitalism and consumption as a way of life has come and changes the reciprocity of people who start wanting money to buy things and to have money and buy individual things that breaks ties of reciprocity. But there are resistances too and indigenous philosophy is a way of resisting in addition to political resistance. They are not separate. The spirit of wisdom gratitude and the warrior spirit are indigenous. We cannot continue to have indigenous philosophies without the living presence of indigenous peoples. 
for it is about ways of living and having a living experience of the world. Indigenous philosophies are not philosophical discourses. They are not beliefs in the sense of abstraction only. They are not just rational. These are ways of life that need people living these ways. Indigenous philosophies don't detach themselves from life, the earth and the cosmos. They are the expression of philosophies imminent to life, to living within community, to the earth and to the cosmos. As a way of life, these philosophies employ virtues such as caring for others, where no one in a village can be left without a home or food, for example. It's unthinkable for indigenous philosophies for someone to be unassisted, to be homeless, without food and everything else that's essential to life. And this is not about belief, again, but about practices in a way of life where all beings deserve respect. Some thinkers like Vine Deloria, a Native American philosopher, show that for indigenous philosophies, the truth is not just abstract, it's not just rational or a belief. To be true, it needs to be a way of life, a way of relating to beings and the world. This is very different from certain traditions still dominant in the West, where truth is the abstract and eternal truth behind all phenomena, detached from the phenomena of the cosmos. The truth of the individual in indigenous philosophies is always linked, related to truths in the cosmos. The human being or spirit is a type of individual production, but it's also always a type of recreation of the cosmos. Every human being has a spirit, just like all animals and plants, and in many cultures, mineral beings, rivers, mountains also have their spirits. And in addition, you also have the great spirit in many cultures, the being that unites everything which is the source of creation. In thinking, this is expressed sometimes by a game, an interplay of dualisms, much more than by dualisms. For example, the individual is not an essence separate from the essence of the cosmos. They are produced differences, but where you don't have a separation, a dualism as a separation. We have in many indigenous philosophies a minimum of two truths that act. Truths are produced in relations with differences and difference means a minimum of two sides must exist. There can be several sides, the side of the heart, the mind, the side of the body and the side of the spirit, north, south, east, west, fire, air, water and earth many sides of a truth that can be one and multiple at the same time. For this reason and much more, it's unthinkable for indigenous philosophies to say that the human being has separated itself from nature. Because as the indigenous thinker Ailton Krenak says, citation, I do not understand where there's anything other than nature. Everything is nature. The cosmos is nature. Everything I can think of is nature. End of citation. I'm showing my studies on this here, and I obviously don't speak either as a philosopher or as an indigenous person. I can't claim an indigenous identity, even if it is a fact that I have indigenous ancestors. Even indigenous people, when going to talk about philosophy, some of them say, look, I'm not a healer, I'm not an old man to know how to speak of this or that. That is, the indigenous people recognize that knowledge or wisdom are not universally accessible or even universally equally distributed. There's a job, there's a work, there's a necessary experience to acquire wisdom. Wisdom is something that's acquired with a certain experience of life, while knowledge can be passed on, can be memorized. The first Native American Indian to have a PhD in philosophy, Viola Cordova, said the following, citation, 
Knowledge in Native American sense is not equated with wisdom. Knowledge with the added awareness of its pragmatic implications comprises wisdom. The ability to clone human beings is certainly a bit of knowledge, but is it wise? End of citation. The indigenous philosopher Cacavera, for example, says that one can learn about the inner nature of being, and that wisdom is a mysterious inspiration that comes from the depths of being. It's not the result of study alone. Wisdom is the result of inspiration that comes instigated by dreams, by intuition, songs. It does not need to come from the rational. Not only people think. Thought is not a gift of the human being only. Knowledge is rational, it's information, but wisdom is an experience, a powerful inner experience that makes the person live differently. Music, for example, singing, has the function in many indigenous cultures of healing, of providing mental, physical and spiritual health. And in many cultures, as in the Shavanti culture, for example, it's in the dream that the songs, music are created and they fulfill various functions in society. In the past, anthropologists used the discourse on the primitive, that reigned until at least half of the 20th century. Some anthropologists of the past, like Levi Bru, said things like, the primitive doesn't like discursive operations of thought, he has no reflection, he only lives in mysticism in which subject and object are mixed, he said. Others who came later, like Paul Radan, directly questioned this notion and said that there are thinkers among so-called primitives. But still, here you have a white man talking about how primitive thinks, how he lives, etc. This was a colonial way of talking about others that puts everyone as the same, reduces them, sometimes idealizes them. But indigenous peoples are not all the same. Even indigenous thought shows at all times that it is from the diversity that comes the richness and the beauty of life. It's the diversity of forms of life that is revered, that is sacred, that allows life itself and the cosmos to exist. This constant production of difference, a difference that is always relational, is always being produced because it is a relationship, and you have no relationship if you don't have diversity and movement. Unfortunately, much of this difference has been annihilated for a long time by a system that produces sameness. The colonization of the continents started a genocidal system of indigenous peoples that is now consummated in capitalism that also produces sameness in ways of being in ways of being, thinking, acting, and living. The indigenous peoples have bravely resisted until today, reinventing themselves, producing their difference in new ways, even producing, as a Brazilian indigenous thinker, Ailton Krenak says, new forms of subjectivity, new visions, new poetics of existence, which at the same time are linked to differentiation that is the cosmos. Ailton Krenak says, citation, we are definitely not the same, and it is wonderful to know that each one of us here is different from the other, like constellations. The fact that we can share this space, that we are traveling together, does not mean that we are the same. It means exactly that we are able to attract each other through our differences, which should guide our life path. Having diversity, not a humanity with the same protocol. Because that, until now, was just a way to homogenize and take away our joy of being alive. End of citation. This joy of being alive in indigenous philosophies is completely linked to celebrating and thanking life for recreating life. The indigenous writer and philosopher Daniel Munduruku says that 
when the indigenous people sing and dance by stomping their feet on the floor, they are not just making noise or just making music. They are making the gesture of creation, the gesture of recreating eternity in the present. Creation and the movement of creation that continues in our present. There is no dualism that separates the present from eternity. Kakavera also speaks of the meaning of tupi as being the sound of feet. That is, he points to the direct connection between sound and creation, between songs, music, words, and nature and the cosmos. Nature's entities like fire, water, earth, and air, with these, the relationship is one of reverence and gratitude. It's a search for understanding our key relations that connect us to Mother Earth and to the cosmos. Cacavera speaks of indigenous gratitude to the ancestor who shaped the body that we are, because the human being is a co-creator of himself and of the world. The human being is an unfolding of the great creation and co-creator of himself and of nature. Creation is in progress. It's up to the human being to reach the wisdom to walk on the path of creation and not against creation. But here nothing is more different from dominant Western thought, which largely denies life in favor of another life in the hereafter than this way of thinking. Indigenous philosophies are statements of life on earth, an affirmation of life on earth and in the cosmos. In relation to subjectivity, to the inner experience, it's not seen as a way of escaping, but as a way of having a deep connection with life, with community and with the cosmos. That is, to differentiate is to be alive, to be connected to the cosmos. Our joy in being alive depends on the production of differences, on the possibility of life for difference. The exaggerated sameness that we live in the world today is against life, makes different ways of life impossible, and at the same time destroys the production of difference that nature is. As the indigenous shaman Davi Kopenawa says, nature needs us to have this caring relationship. When we destroy nature, we are destroying ourselves, and it turns against us ourselves. Kopenawa says, citation, when the Indian and the forest are over, it will be the end of the world. End of citation. For indigenous philosophies, everything that belongs to nature is sacred. There's, there's a respect for all forms of animal, plant, and miner, mineral life, and for the spirits of nature. In indigenous philosophies, the universe is all life. Everything is full of life. And this brings with it an ethics of care and respect for all beings. As Vine Deloria said, the ancient Indians had the experience of life present in everything, so the universe itself thus made more sense. Respect is a concept widely used in indigenous philosophies as this form of relation between beings where there's a strong sense of individual identity which is, which is not independent of the sense of individual identity of other beings. In reality, the individual identity of each being in order to be respected, there must be respect between all beings. Respect involves self-knowledge and self-discipline, while it also involves communication and agreements with other forms of life. That's why in many cultures we can see that the hunter becomes sorry for having to kill an animal to eat and soon pays tribute, thanks the spirit of the animal, shows respect not only mentally or spiritually, but also in practice, for example, by not killing more than one needs for, for eating, for, for living, by not overeating, by destroying not more than one needs in order to live. Native Americans have the use of the expression, all my relatives, all my relations among some cultures, uh, to invoke respect and interrelation between all beings. 
This form of relationship with other beings is also a means of gaining knowledge and wisdom, looking at the interrelationships of everything. To seek to know how to live, indigenous philosophy will always seek this in its relations with other beings, with community and with nature. And respect has to do with ancestry. The indigenous ancestors are the people of the past who died, plus the grandparents from nature, the rocks, mountains, rivers, etc., which are grandparents or mothers or fathers of many peoples. Humans, animals, and even the physical world, like rivers and rocks, are related. Even beings that Westerners considered to be inanimate can have life in the sense that they are the originators of life and at the same time they have their sensibilities. There is even the case of communication between humans and animals or between humans and rivers, mountains, etc. And there is also spiritual ancestry, the spirits, the many spirits in nature, the spirits of animals, of plants, and also the great spirit, a great mystery that involves everything. Many anthropologists uh, and others have said that these are ind indigenous beliefs, they are cultures, what I'm here calling philosophies. But many anthropologists separate belief from way of life and experience, even when calling something a belief, it's being said that it is something abstract. They are certainly stories told. Indigenous philosophies are told by stories, although, as I am saying, they are ways of life. Modes of thought are ways of living, and indigenous philosophy may then only be understood by those who live it, and even more so by those who speak the native language. The presence in the world, the experience of the world we have, is directly linked to our formation of our gaze, of knowledge, of the sensations that a culture instigates in us. And if this culture instigates communication with animals, with plants, with rivers and mountains, with the cosmos, this presence in the world is an experience that is difficult to put into words or to just teach. It comes from many places and words are not enough. It's an ethics of presence in the here and now, at the same time that it is a connection with the infinite, with nature and with the eternal. Indigenous philosophy is not one thing, it's not a model, just the opposite. And here, as a provocation, I will speak of indigenous philosophy in the singular because I want to speak to the dominant Western thought in a language that it understands. Indigenous philosophy is the recognition and practice of producing difference, the incommensurability of the world at the same time that it is a surrendering of oneself to the world as an affirmation of this world and everything that exists as no philosophy has ever achieved. Because other philosophies must first say what they are not for, for later to take on new paths. Whoever was born in the West and knows the dominance of life-denying ways of thought, of the dogmatic way of thinking and living, knows what I'm talking about. The indigenous philosophy does not start from this critique, it starts from the affirmation, and from there it later denies what needs to be denied, colonialism, capitalism, dominant ways of thought and the whole colonizing and life-destroying processes. The view that everything is connected, that life is a web of relations, is part of the thought of many cultures around the world. But where it is not just a rational view, where it is a way of living, it's with these ways that the thought of the relation between everything and everything else needs to be linked. Western dominant tradition has thought, reason, as primary in relation to action in the world. This reason, detached from its relations, is a reason that detaches from life and shows this in practice. We need more than ever to listen to our indigenous relatives around the world. 
And we don't just need to listen. We need to learn and change our ways of living, not to live in an ideal, romantic world, quite the contrary, so that we can still tell new stories that can postpone the end of the world, so that we can relate to the differences that we are and that deserve their space in this cosmos. There's no turning back in history, we just move forward. But going forward does not mean that everything needs to be denied, that the past does not return in some way, even if differently. Difference always returns. Difference, the differences in the world, will always be here. And it is as an experience of difference that a life becomes more, that the world becomes more interesting and produces joys, songs, poetry, and new possibilities for life. No one is ever the same as anyone else. And that's why we should have a world that proliferates the possibilities of difference, because it is what we are made of. It's the difference in respectful relations to our relatives, and our relatives are not only human. And they are not less than us because they are not human. We are part of a web of relations, and our human relatives, animals, plants, stones, planets, stars, are part of what we are in these relations. Those who do not understand this do not understand indigenous philosophy. It's not about belief. It's a way of relating to the world the highest affirmation of that world, the affirmation of everything that exists. There is nothing that can be a statement or a an affirmation that goes beyond that. The affirmation of the beyond is a negation of the world. That Nietzsche has already taught me a lot. Indigenous philosophy teaches me the real affirmation of the world and of life, which Nietzsche himself was also looking for and found in some thinkers of the past, like Heraclitus and Spinoza and others. But we have these philosophies of affirmation today alive, philosophies that come to critique the dominant Western way of thinking, it, and that is because we are in the middle of that dominance and cannot ignore it. It is necessary to critique the dominant ways of thinking and ways of living. But before that, it's always necessary to start from an affirmation of life. We must critique Western or capitalist or dominant modes of thought and life only where they cannot be ignored in an attempt to overcome them when they harm us. But in our daily life, the affirmation needs to be first in relation to critique. As Nietzsche said, it's from a great yes to life that one can be more critical, saying the big no to everything that denies life. With regards to the affirmation of life, it's not a question of belief or just a symbol, but the manifestation of creation in reality. It's a flowering of reality, an emanation. The performance of a ritual, for example, is an emanation because it starts from otherness, starts from the dream, from vision, comes into singing, to ritual, becomes something that unfolds in reality, creating reality. And why creating reality? Here we quote Vine Deloria again, citation. The real interest of the old Indians was not to find the abstract structure of physical reality, but rather to find the proper road along which, for the duration of a person's life, individuals were supposed to walk. End of citation. This meaning of life as the search for the individual path, which of course for the indigenous people is never just individual against the collective. There is no dualism between individual and society, as I said. At this point, we can establish relations with ancient philosophy uh, of the Greeks, for example. Ancient Greek philosophers were largely not concerned with building rational discursive systems about reality. 
The concern was much more about how to live. Philosophy as a way of life, as philosopher Pierre Hadot says in the book Spiritual Exercises and Ancient Philosophy. Ancient philosophers largely looked for ways to become others of themselves, according to Hadou. And this practice of seeking to become another of oneself included the attempt to open up to the cosmos. That is, there was a practice of individuation, of singularization, but one that was always open to universalization, to nature. There were, for example, among Epicureans and the Stoics, exercises to provide attention and experience of themselves and of the world as a complete here and now, a present where past and future united. Hado says, citation, whoever practices this exercise sees the universe with new eyes, as if seeing it for the first time. He discovers in the enjoyment of the pure present, the mystery and splendor of existence. And, as Nietzsche used to say, we say yes, not only to ourselves, but to all existence. End of citation. This is not just the result of a thought. It's a whole practice, a training that leads to an experience. So the ancient uh, Greek philosophers practiced spiritual exercises. And not to get to know everything, this is impossible. Even the indigenous great spirit is a great mystery. But they, uh, they were looking to live differently, to put oneself in motion, as everything is in motion, in relation, passing from air to earth to fire to water, and on and on again, always differentiating. Becoming, as Nietzsche says, cannot just be understood rationally. Indigenous philosophies and the meaning that indigenous subjects give themselves are imminent in a way of living. The meaning of life is here given by the relation to life, not by abstract ideas, but by our relations and what they allow us to experience in terms of an affirmation of oneself, of others, of places, of the whole cosmos. The meaning of life for indigenous thought is not sought elsewhere than in life, but right here, in the here and now, and in relations with others and with the earth, with the cosmos. In fact, the human being in indigenous thought is not uh, the only one who has knowledge. Knowledge is also coming from animals, plants, nature, that are teachers that help us cure diseases and that teach us how to live. This communication of nature comes in many forms. It comes in dreams, visions, and what the West calls hallucinations, or the unconscious, or the irrational. And for indigenous peoples, many times these are parts of the real. The West and its universal reason detached from an affirmation of a way of life needs to find a final and instrumental explanation for everything in this dominant way of thinking that is founded on truth and on reason. Indigenous thought, on the other hand, does not need to have all the explanations about everything to recognize diverse rationalities, even in what a Westerner would, would call irrational. Where the dominant discourse in the West is about natural laws, and these laws need to be explained in a rational way, the indigenous thought of some authors like Vine Deloria accept that this is just a map of the territory and one cannot take the map for the territory. For example, to believe that gravity can be explained entirely by a mathematical formula for Vine Deloria would be to make a mistake about the territory called gravity, uh, taking the map the mathematical formula for the territory. The indigenous view would know that there is much more and that the ultimate explanation of anything is not just rational or can be just made rational. Finally, remember that indigenous philosophies don't exist without indigenous ways of life. But this burden 
of saving nature can no longer be a burden that indigenous people have to bear. Even they don't think that we can save nature because nature is ourselves. We have to live in a way that respects ourselves. I will leave links here on the video description for you to read indigenous philosophers directly from the sources, also to hear them talking on videos. And because we are at a time where indigenous peoples are suffering greatly uh, from being affected by a pandemic that affects them much more than, the, than other peop many other people due to vulnerability that they already suffer by the system, I will leave here a link for you that can help them, the articulation of indigenous people of Brazil. If you can, please support their work. I also want to remind that I am teaching a course on the history of sexuality now in volume two of Michel Foucault uh, for the supporters of this project, of this channel. The link to become a supporter and student on Patreon is in the video description. I thank all my supporting students once again and see you next week.